Hello everybody and welcome to a special edition of In Pit Lane and unfortunately it's uh, it's a, a position we didn't want to be in. As you know, last week on the show we told you that this week our special guest would be Peter Brock. It was an interview we recorded a couple of weeks ago just before Peter headed off to Goodwood for the Goodwood Revival and of course before his tragic visit to Targa West. Peter, as per usual, was the perfect guest. I always said he was... You didn't have to work when Peter was in the studio. You said, hello, Brock, and he, he did 20 minutes. The difference was it was 20 minutes of quality. It's been very hard to decide whether we should run this interview tonight, um, but in the end we've decided that probably in the spirit of what the man wanted and the things he has to say, that it's a fitting tribute to Peter Brock. Uh, some of the, I will let you know that we have edited some of the footage um, for reasons which uh, are just not important right now. But whatever, we're obviously here at Sandown looking down Brock Strait and uh, it's, it's a very sad place today, far sadder than, uh, than you would normally expect under these circumstances. Peter Brock meant a lot to everybody in motorsport, he meant a lot to this program. I've said before, if it wasn't for Peter Brock there wouldn't be an in-pit lane uh, and th those people who know the history of the program would know why. But anyway, unfortunately for the final time, this is Peter Brock on in-pit lane two weeks ago. A couple of years ago, quite a few years ago now, we all traipsed out to Sandown to, uh, to say goodbye to you. It was your mm. retirement. Um, for somebody who's retiring, retiring, you seem very bloody busy. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have a great appetite for life. I mean, most people, I guess, if, they, if they've got a passion for, say, driving a racing car, they like to find a way of still getting behind the wheel having a bit of a go. Not so much in the competitive side of things, although... The teeth do grow a bit occasionally and you sort of think, hey, I could do this. Um, but, um, you know, you're a long time not doing it. And, I mean, I'm fit and healthy, why not do it? So, although I'm not in the main game, I've got no desire to be out there doing it on that level. Um, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of boutique events around there. I'm very concerned about the health of Australian motorsport in general, which means other events other than supercars. And, uh, you know, it's therefore I sort of like to get involved, you know. Speaking of boutique events, one of them that uh, is coming up in a, in a couple of weeks' time is uh, overseas at Goodwood, the Goodwood Revival. Now, we went to the Goodwood Festival of Speed a couple of years back, uh, which, was, which was interesting, and we showed people that. But just for people who don't know what the Revival is, just explain why it's different from pretty much any other historic meeting in the world. Yeah. Well, you've got a dress in period dress, which I guess other people try to do. There which period? A, well, pre-66. 49 to 66, I think, is, an, is the era they like to depict. Then you've got um, a perimeter around the pit area, and inside that perimeter, which is quite large, no vehicle of any type is allowed in there, which is post-66. So you've got this magnificent car park uh, full of collectibles. You know, there's Jags and TRs and Heelys and AC Cobras, and, I mean, the list just goes on and on even to the extent where the tow vehicles and the old wheelbarrows and things like that are used either within the pit area to sort of transport around wheels and tyres and things like that. Sounds like it's a round of Victorian State Series. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? The way. But look, it's, it's a fascinating place to visit because the competitors are absolutely full on. And I mean, last year I was in the TT. I'm going to go on the TT again in a couple of weeks in a, driving a Corvette, the same Corvette I drove last year, actually. And I said to Emmanuel Piro, one of my old sort of protagonists from years gone by, he was still racing, I think, in the Italian series or whatever. One, one at uh, Road America this weekend. OK, well, he one can series, drive. Yes. That's not what we kid ourselves. I, 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 driving for Audi or something like yes, that, I guess. Yes, the R10. Anyway, he said, um, I said, what's the most expensive car in the race here, Emmanuel? And he said, ooh, this, this uh, Ferrari over here, it was, I think it was a Testarossa and it was a 63 or 64, and he said it's worth 25 million US, 12 million pound. And you might think, oh, it's a treasure that they're gonna park over here and no one's ever gonna sort of get it out and you know, give it a lashing. Excuse me, they get these cars out there. They are, they are involved, it's like V8 supercars, there's fender bending, there's cars running off the road everywhere. It's, it's fantastic racing. And it's based on the fact that if you race these collectibles, their value goes up. Now, I was under the impression, erroneously, that when you had a car such as, let's say my uh, 
84 VK, which Peter Champion owns, the Bathurst winning VK, that fluorescent Marlborough car. We raced that, took it over to the Festival of Speed, and uh, brought it back and got a bit of ink and everything else, the value went up. The same thing goes for this early model Holden. I'm going to drive over there in a couple of weeks' time, this 48 series. It will start off with a car with, you know, not much history. It's going to come back with a lot of history. And there'll be 80,000 people there every day. Uh, the Australian Tourist Commission in London is currently running a competition in The Guardian to come to Goodwood, meet Peter Brock, get your photograph taken with his early model Holden. They've never seen a 48 series. It was an interesting choice. I mean, when you uh, put together, because the thing about the Goodwood regulations is they're totally different to anything we have in Australia. Tell us about the about the 48 215 that has been built for you yeah. and the difference between what you'd run in, say, Group N here in Australia. Well, there's, there are significant differences. For instance, to allow more cars to be competitive, they've said you can run a disc brake front end, as long as it's a period front end, period disc. So we put a HD Holden disc and caliper on the car because it has to be all pre-66 and from the same manufacturer. Uh, we're allowed to fit another manual transmission to it based on the fact that um, some of those early cars, particularly of the British variety, have a Wilson pre-selector or a, an automatic transmission, early model type stuff, and they're not suitable for running. But you could get an old Lagonda or something like that, apply these regulations to it, and it becomes a pretty good race car, or it becomes a car you at least can race. So when we actually did this the early model hold, and I don't know if it made it go much faster per lap, but it turns it into a pretty damn good race car. I mean, you can actually get stuck into it. I did 10 laps on end at Calder the other day before we put it on the boat to go over there, and to be honest with you, the variation in lap times is only two tenths of a second over 10 laps. And that means you've got a pretty you know, reliable, raceable car. The interesting thing, I mean, you have a look at a 48 215 or you know, the FX, as some people erroneously yeah. call it, um, you'd think that you know, this is a really heavy car, but it's not all that heavy, really, is it? No, 40 pound, or just on 20 kilos lighter than the XU1 Tirana. Now, you, the grey motor, uh, we could have done a little bit more with it because you can increase the engine capacity by 25%, but just due to time constraints and costs and everything else, Ian Tate, who was the ex-chief uh, mechanic for Holden Dealer Team back in those XU1 uh, days, he only went up from 2.2 to 2.4 litre. And he kept it reliable, kept it simple, but he managed to get nearly 190 horsepower out of the thing and very good torque. So in fact, it's got horsepower and torque not unlike the 186 XU1 Tiranas that we raced back in those days when Ian built those cars for Harry Firth in 1970. So it gets down the main straight of Calder in a very respectable manner. It's about 200 kilometres now at the end of the straight. Think, this old hump is looking good. Yeah. Well, certainly that's one thing you're doing, but you've got a lot of other things on the go uh, coming up. And uh, when we return to In Pit Lane after this break, we'll have more with our special guest tonight, Peter Brock. You're watching In Pit Lane. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Winpit Lane, our special guest, Peter Brock. Now, Peter, before the break, we were talking about Goodwood, but that's certainly not the only thing that you've uh, been doing. You've also been, uh, this year, fagging around in Richard Bendel's uh, Daytona Cobra, and the uh, Mount Buller Sprint is coming up fairly soon, and you're going to be back behind the wheel of that again. Tell us how that all came about. How did you come involved with that, that particular car? Oh, well, it, it all came about because Holden ceased manufacturer of the Monaro, and uh, someone within the system there sold the car as driving to a private collector, Trevor Young, the late Trevor Young from Beatty Model Cars. And so we were left without a competitive car. And Richard rang me up and said, would you like to drive the Daytona? He says, basically, sort of like a Monaro with about three or 400 kilograms taken out of it and a little low svelte sort of sports car body. I said, oh, I'm a driver of that thing. So I took it out and had a drive. And I thought, here's a car with great potential. Um, Richard, of course, a real engineer, boffin, Mr. Motec. That's, that's Richard mm. Bendel. And it's just been a great project to get involved with. Now, as we speak, I'm about to head off to Goodwood. I just got on the telephone recently to them to say, can you get me out of UK nice and early on the Monday morning after the race? Because I've got to land, uh, unpack my suitcase, throw some stuff together and meet Mick Hone, my navigator, in Perth 
for Targa West, which begins on Tuesday after, uh, sorry, Thursday afternoon. So, uh, I'm oh, you're going gonna to be, be in good. Yeah, you're going to be in good condition. Yeah, aren't well, you? we are. We so I've got uh, Thursday, Friday, uh, Saturday, Sunday in the Daytona over there, and that's a precursor. We're sorting this car out. We're getting it cracking, I can tell you, because then we're going to do Targa New Zealand in that car. Then come back and do with another new car that Richard's building, uh, do the uh, Mount Buller Sprint. So it's a very you know, a very comprehensive motorsport package, but I'm a bit of a fan of these tarmac rallies. I mean, at the moment we've got V8 supercars and everything else is sort of struggling a bit, but you go to, uh, say, Targa, and there's 300 cars or 400 cars out there. Often they are beautiful cars, very collectible, uh, very expensive, baby boomers galore. <laughs> they've got these cars, they've got the money to throw at it, and they're, they're out there doing their stuff, and it's, it's a whole new world. And it's interesting, I mean, the success of things like the Mount Buller Sprint, I mean, I suppose, you know, Target Tasmania beget the Mount Buller Sprint, beget the Dutton's Rally, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I just see the other day that the uh, organisers of, uh, of Buller and Lake Mountain, of course, you've been up Lake Mountain before, they've now announced that uh, coming up on the Australia Day weekend, you're not only going up Mount, uh, Lake Mountain, coming down. you're going to come down as well. So, That's got to be fun. Well, I've just been talking to a guy um, from uh, RDA, and I've had a bit of a commercial involvement there for a bit. And we're talking about developing a new brake package uh, with bigger discs, better ventilation, uh, big six-spot calipers, a whole deal. And one of the reasons that we're talking about doing this is to get it ready for that Australia Day weekend when you've got to come down Lake Mountain. We reckon a lot of cars are going to finish up with uh, very tired brakes after the first four or five kilometres because it is steep. It's fast, but you do have some slow connecting corners. So, yeah, I it's it's very interesting to get involved with some of these uh, automotive industry suppliers and to see the old story of racing improves and brilliant. Yeah. And it really is. It's great to sort of turn back time a bit to uh, get involved with a, developing a car, uh, talking to, you know, tyre people and brake people and shock absorber people and whatever you about building a car that can really get out there and do the, jo do the job and take on the exotics, you know, the uh, Lambos and Porsches and goodness knows what. You mentioned about V8 supercar racing in the state of Australian motorsport at the moment. Um, putting on sort of, you know, looking towards the future, I mean, where do you see motorsport going over the next few years? Yes, uh, as we speak, I've just come from a Stratum Grand Prix board meeting, of which I'm a director of that organisation, and uh, of course everyone knows that V8 supercars aren't racing at that race. Uh, in the year 2007. I don't know about beyond that, but we just accept the fact that Avesco want to do their own thing in that time. And we're looking at this saying, this is opportunity. A lot of categories are out there uh, struggling to sort of get a, a means of showcasing their product. So we think we can put on a pretty damn good show, um, utilising young talent and different categories of racing, etc. So supercars are certainly a, a very strong game, uh, very expensive. Be fair to say that uh, it's probably beyond the means of a lot of the participants. I mean, the, the top guys have got the dollar, they can do it properly. But when you get down the, the pecking order a bit, um, you know, it's hard to generate that level of sponsorship uh, knowing that you're not going to be in the top 10. And they don't have that variety anymore that you had when, when you were racing. I mean, you were running in touring cars, but then you'd jump into something like The Beast, the, you the sports sedan, you and you do sports sedans. I mean, you also very briefly uh, jumped behind the wheel. I think it was a, a, a Baran or a Formula 2 car. I had a Formula car. 2 car, I did indeed. Yeah. I mean, look, one of the things about supercars is the fact that they all have the same diff ratio, the same exhaust type system, the same le sound level. So they all change gears at the same point. Yeah. With other cars, or a way that you could have it, there was a certain means of altering the performance parameter for a car on that day. Now, that's one of the things that, look, on the one hand, it's a great strength of V8 supercars. On the other, you could sit back and say, well, hang on, why don't you let, why don't you let them chuck a set of bridge stones on the car instead of the controlled Dunlops? Or what about you change the diff ratio or change the exhaust system or something like that? So with the other categories, I guess, they're in a difficult position. They, they need to survive, but at the moment, they're probably poised on the cusp of actually getting a great deal of public recognition 
because they are, you know, a different category, like GT Performance, for instance, or the GT cars, um, GT2, GT3, some of those categories. Maybe, maybe uh, they'll become commercially viable. At the moment, they're not really commercially viable, but they are still a lot of fun and a very different experience for those participants. And once again, as you say, different vehicle dynamics, which makes they for are. good spectators and, and as well. And look, the little cars catch them through the tight bits and the big cars blow them off down the straight. It's the way that, I mean, Moffat and myself, we had a ball doing that sort of stuff back there all those years ago, a little XU1 Tirana, a big bad Falcon GT, that sort of stuff. And it'd be fair to say that the public still remembers that and they do recognise it being a pretty good sort of era in Australian motorsport. So, I don't know, I guess at the moment we're looking at choices really, aren't we? I mean, it's fine to have the supercars out there doing their thing and I, I must say I applaud them. I, I was part of the people <laughs> who sat down there with Larry Perkins, Dick Johnson, Alan Moffat, myself. We, we wrote the regulations yeah. and they're still there. But by the same token, it, you know, it is healthy to have other manufacturers involved. OK, well, uh, on that note, we'll, we're going to take another break now, but when we come back, we'll have more from our special guest tonight on In Pit Lane, Peter Brock. You're watching In Pit Lane. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching In Pit Lane, our special... Oh, there we are, we're on camera one. You're watching In Pit Lane on camera one, and our special guest, probably on camera four, will be Peter Brock. Peter, before the break, talking about the, the future of motorsport and the, the fact you've been so busy over the past few years, once again, for someone who's retired, we've seen a lot of you this year. You've been, we've seen Denton and uh, Talking Heads and all these sorts of sorts of things. A lot of it to do with sort of you know, your personal life and all the rest of it. You, do you, have you felt comfortable about all that? Yeah, look, I think I'm a bit of an open book. Um, at the, I, I guess you get to a certain point in life where you go, look, I am what I am, and even when you're dealing with uh, the general public. Uh, I suppose as a young person, and I'm referring here to some of the uh, young sporting stars, particularly motor racing, of course, that uh, try to, you know, be politically correct about a lot of things. And I, from a mentoring point of view, my I encourage them just to say it as it is, because you need the Jason Ackermanner sort of approach, I reckon, quite often in motorsport, where someone's just going to say, well, that's how it is. Um, I've never been backward in coming forward. I've always been as honest as I can possibly be. So if someone wants to dissect you and say, what makes you tick? Well, I'm happy enough doing that. And I know when I get out there in the big wide world doing a, a public appearance at, say, a Holden dealership, and I just did one the other day down at the Holden dealership in Hamilton, and they came out in their droves. And they brought out all their old knickknacks and stuff, and they all said, oh, we saw you on TV, and etc. And they... They feel very, they treat me as a very familiar sort of part of the furniture, if you like, because they've seen me for so long and then they, they can come up to me and just have a bit of a chat and I'll say, how's the kids and what sort of car you're driving? And so I, I don't mind that uh, rapport with the public because it, it, to me it's more genuine and I feel better about it. I feel like I'm giving back something to the community by opening up, if you like. But some of those people, as you say, I mean, some of them actually, like, worship you. I mean, the people who are just over the yeah. top, and, we are, and we've met them over the years, you sort of yeah. meet them, and there are people who really they worship do. you. Does, does that it, ever frighten you? Yeah, you look, get, you know, that sort of devotion? It, it is. Well, I think after a while you realise you have a certain responsibility to the public at large and that you are a role model and that people are going to take notice of what you're saying and doing. So, you, you know, you have a choice as a public personality as a rock star or a, race, or a race driver, if you like, where you can take the money and run and say, I'm demanding my privacy, you know, media intrusion, etc. I don't think that's a very reasonable approach because if it wasn't for the media, if it wasn't for the public, you wouldn't be able to do what you love doing. So I figure this is sort of like payback time, you know? Like, here I am what I am, I'm going where I am, and, and uh, here you are, folks. If you want me to hold the baby and uh, take the photo and go out and sign the car on the glove box and uh, take a photo with the family, etc. I'll do it. So I, I just feel more comfortable with um, allowing that interaction to sort of take place rather than it being uh, at arm's length and being precious about it. So I don't mind. And as you say, I mean, I've, I've met very few people in my life who are as you know, publicly and privately as positive as you are all the time. But I mean, what about down moments? I mean, does Peter Brock ever get depressed? No, I don't. Um, I'd say at different times I might sit back and, and get uh, doubtful about something 
and say, oh, I don't know, gee. Then I sort of give myself a bit of a wake-up call because I know that what happens, your emotions or your thought patterns allow your energy to go down. And then you've got to get yourself back up. So the easiest thing to do is to, is to have what they loosely call mastery of the mind, which means stop your mind from playing mischief. Be reasonable, be understanding, and at different times rein yourself in when you feel yourself getting to that point where you're just creating a bad experience for yourself. So I, I, I guess some years ago, because of my motor racing uh, experience, I realised that if I was going to be good on this day at this track, I've got to get my emotions in order, my thoughts in order, so that I'm happy and balanced and feeling good about what I'm doing. And when you go good at that, you start getting some level of continuity with your performance. You start realising that there is a thread of, of uh, I suppose, continuity between cause and effect. How you are creates the outcome. So I've just been quite strong on maintaining that point of view. In terms of getting that balance, how important has, been, has your art been in that? I mean, that's something that we've seen in some of the interviews. I mean, you're, you're an excellent painter and all the rest. Where did that come from? Roller Where did that start? Brush, yeah. um, look, I, I did that as a kid. I went to Eltham High School, which was a, yes. an area, you know, very well known for its artistic uh, endeavours. I mean, Monsalvat, just up the road and stuff like that. Uh, then I guess I always loved sketching and what have you. To me, motor racing was always an artistic pursuit rather than an academic, intellectual sort of pursuit. And then when it came to the special vehicles era in the uh, 80s, I loved designing those cars and all the paint jobs of those race cars over the years. You know, I used to sit down and fiddle around and place. I mean, I, I just, so when I stopped being able to do that, when uh, Walkinshaw took over the special vehicles business in the country, I started doing more painting. I started making furniture. I started doing stuff like that because it gave me, I think, a very healthy outlook. So uh, it's part of maintaining your balance, I suppose. If you're a creative person, you've got to do it, whether it's playing the piano or painting or whatever it might be. You've got to act out how you feel. Racing driver, artist. Uh, is there, are, there any, are there any hidden talents? I mean, you mentioned music. I mean, you know, if we, if we dragged in a piano right now, no, you knock out no, some Mozart no. for us or no, something? No, no, I couldn't do that. But I would certainly be sitting back there if I listen to a bit of uh, blues or something like that, I'd say, hey, I like that. <laughs> I should have brought the harp in. I really should have. <laughs> um, Peter, as I said, you've, you've contributed so much to the sport over the year and you're giving a lot back now through, of course, the Peter Brock Foundation. If people want to uh, find out more about that, yeah. we'll put a link on the Inpit Lane website. Well, thank you. Look, we've got the big day out there in Hurst Bridge on November Coming the 12th. Uh, show and shine, come out there and, and assist. Another thing I'm involved with is the Australian Motorsport Foundation and mentoring some of the CAMS rising stars. And it's a fascinating world there, starting to look at some of these young kids coming through about how they're going to make it. What do they need to be thinking? How can they actually get the most out of their life? Because I've been there and done it. And I know I've made some mistakes in my life, but also understand, I guess, that there are certain uh, policies, if you like, and procedures. You, under, you undertake those, you're going to work out pretty good. Well, as I said, uh, thank you for your contribution to the sport over the years. Thanks for joining us tonight. I knew we'd run out of time. We've got so much more to talk about. But for now, Peter Brock, thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Thank you. Once again, Peter leaving us with a great deal of positivity. You know, I've been I've known the guy since I was I first came here to Sandown in 1972 when I was here for the Tasman Series, sitting in the grandstand as, on my 11th birthday present. Uh, Peter Brock was out in a Tirana GTR XU1 racing and probably winning as well. Throughout the years, throughout all of his different cars, throughout all his career moves, we've been watching him and we've been amazed with what he's done in and out of the car. He was a great supporter of the program. He was always supportive of what we were trying to do. And after we did that interview, he hung around for 25 minutes. We spoke about all manner of things, cricket, motorsport, life, the universe and everything. We're going to miss the man a great deal. That goes without saying. Our sympathies and our condolences to all of his friends and family. Uh, he was a great Australian in the true sense of the word and he was certainly one of motorsport's finest, not just here in Australia, but the world over. That's all we have time for. Next week on the program, we'll be down at Phillip Island for the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships, the Formula Fours and the young drivers that Peter spent so much time encouraging. Until then, on a very sad day for Australian motorsport, Thanks for watching. Bye for now.